Well, the Bible says, and I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in church this morning. It's a blessing. I want us to consider a passage from Revelation chapter 3 this morning. Revelation chapter number 3 and verse number 14. Revelation 3, 14. And Brother Gibbish, if you could go behind me and turn that fan off so it doesn't blow my notes all over the auditorium. I don't particularly need the fan. You might want it down there. Revelation chapter number 3 and number 14. Once you've found that, I'll have you stand as we read from God's Word this morning. Uh, we're going to read from verse 14 all the way down to verse number 19. Revelation chapter 3, verse number 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, The thing saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I would spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, and that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke, and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we had together this morning. We are indeed grateful for your goodness, the blessings you give us, the privilege to be here again this morning. Thankful for the safety on the road for each one that traveled in today. And we pray that this morning, as we consider your word once again, that you will do what I cannot do, and that is speak to the hearts of the people here. Father, just help us to shut our thoughts in this morning for just a little while so we can focus our attention entirely upon you, that your name will be lifted up and glorified. And Father, if there's even one here that's not saved, I pray that they will get that settled before they leave this place. Perhaps there's somebody listening online today that uh, does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that today would be the day that they would drive that stake in and make it sure that they know, should they die today, that they would go to heaven. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I yep. uh, just wanted to remind folks that are here, if you're visiting, uh, we do have coffee and refreshments at the back and encourage you to stay and just have some fellowship time with us. Usually the ladies bring in some uh, baked goods or special things for us to eat as well after the service. So if you would like, please feel free to join us for coffee. I grew up on coffee. And uh, my mom actually gave me coffee. I was weaned on coffee at six months old. She started giving me coffee. My mom was a coffee drinker. She had this big black pot, sat on the stove, I mean, it seemed 24-7, and uh, it would bubble away, bubble away, and, uh, you know, like most cowboys say, if you drop a horseshoe in it, the horseshoe should stand up if it's good coffee. Well, my mom's coffee was kind of like that. It was very strong, and uh, I got to like coffee, and uh, later on, my mom tried giving it to one of my boys when they were growing up at two months old. My wife just told him, come unglued, like, what are you doing? And uh, it's not good for him. And uh, he, he never drank coffee until last year, and he's in his 40s. <laughs> but uh, we're so grateful for the fact that we have coffee in our house. I'm not 100% sure, but I think when you get to heaven and you go to your mansion and turn the hot water tap on, you'll get coffee. And so I hope you're a coffee drinker this morning. But one thing I don't like is lukewarm coffee. I, I, I enjoy hot coffee. I can even drink cold coffee uh, for a stretch, but I prefer to have my coffee hot. If it's lukewarm, uh, it's just distasteful to me. I don't like it at all. But Jesus feels that way about some Christians, so it would seem, as we consider his text here, and as far as addressing the church of Laodicea. He said they were neither hot nor cold. Uh, somewhere in the middle, and uh, that was what he said is lukewarm. And that nauseates him, and he says, that's so much so I would like to spew them out of my mouth. Now, the church of Laodicea, if I could tell you this, um, the conditions of that church is typical of the church in 2023, it would seem, in these last days of grace. The word Laodicea means the rights of the people. And if you look around us and you listen today, you'll find out that seems to be the uh, uh, conversation in every quarter. People are talking about my rights, about me, about uh, what affects me, what affects, uh, you know, um, the things around me. And although 
we know that there are some blessings that God has given to us as far as rights as a born-again Christian. Um, but I think that the church, people in the Laodicean days, only thought of themselves. I mean, it doesn't take you long to look around, listen to the media, and you'll hear about certain groups, you know, that uh, uh, have, they elevate their rights without any thought of anybody else. But the rights of the Lord Jesus Christ were not even considered in this church of Laodicea. Sadly, that's the way it is in many circles today. It seems like um, the true churches today lift up Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the creator of all things. And yet many just kind of put him on the shelf behind and look towards programs and different things to uh, attract people into their churches. They do everything to please people. They preach to please, they, they, they sing to please, they, they have programs to please. Can I just suggest to you, the church ought to be a place to please Christ. The church ought to be a place where Jesus Christ is lifted up. Um, so who are these people that the Bible speaks about as nauseating to Jesus? They're not the unbelievers, and, and they're not the atheists. And they are not the, uh, uh, the outrageous, gross sinner. That's not who it's talking about. He's speaking to lukewarm, indifferent, neglectful Christians who cause the preacher uh, the most concerns. You know, and, and could I just suggest to you, who is the people that cause the preacher the most concerns? Who, who is it that impedes and hurts the growth of the church today or the progress of the church? It's not the unbeliever, and it's not the atheist, it's not the outsider, it's not the consecrated, diligent Christian either. It's a lukewarm, indifferent church member. The preacher spends much of his time trying to uh, encourage, um, to get Christians to serve God with their whole heart, to live for Christ, um, to come into church on Sunday, but live that way on Monday too, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, all the way through the week. And it's sad when some will come to church on Sunday and, and put on an air and, and seem to be uh, spiritual, but on Monday, my, you wouldn't know them from the rest of the world. You know, we don't expect an unsaved person to serve the Lord. That would be uncanny. Uh, if a person is a consecrated Christian, we know he or she is going to sell out and serve God with a whole heart. But if a Christian is lukewarm, he becomes a, well, a poor example, if you please. And really, the church is hurt by that kind of a story life. Somebody that says one thing and lives another. Or says one thing uh, in church but treats their wife or their husband or their children differently than what you know, they profess that they might be in church. Question, is a lukewarm Christian lost? Well, the answer is no. A lukewarm Christian is not lost. If he believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior, he has or she has eternal life. You are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption, the Bible says. He will never come into condemnation after you have trusted Jesus as your Savior. Um, that was settled at the cross at Calvary by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, that individual has passed from death unto life the moment they trusted Christ and invited him into their life. Nothing will ever separate him or her from the will of God. His will is for them to be in heaven. Christ has purchased that individual, that Christian, and he belongs to Jesus. That will never change. But the Christian can lose some things by being indifferent, by being lukewarm. The Christian can lose the joy of their salvation. And, and they, they wake up, you know, uh, almost like inside feeling a, a great wantonness, something to change, something with vitality, some richness to us, and they can't seem to ever grasp on what happened. Well, the relationship is there. That will not change between that individual that's saved and their Savior. God is their father. They are God's child. But the fellowship can be fractured just as it is with your own children. When they get out of line and they don't behave or they, uh, they do something that is uh, unkind to you or they, they lie to you or um, they're not real about their uh, you know, living, they, they, they might tell you one thing but live another way. Well, Christ said it's the same with the Christian. You know, um, it's a horrible thing for a Christian to have all the blessings of God wrapped up in all the blessing and the, the packages he has for us to lose all that simply because of, well, maybe they have a feel-good about uh, indifference. Maybe the world attraction is just a little stronger for them. But he or she can lose, yes, that wonderful fellowship. Also, they can 
lose victory over sin. You see, spending time in this book will keep you from sin. You get up early in the morning, you read this book, you'll find the temptation diminishes greatly because you are taking the word of God into your heart, into your life, into your thoughts. Uh, they, they'll lose the enjoyment of reading the word of God. By the way, there's a great blessing from reading the word of God. You say, oh, preacher, I've read it. I know. And, and I've read it over and over and over again, trust me. And every time I do, I get more thrilled than each time I read it. It's a living book. It's a living word. It's not like any other book that's on the shelf. You know, uh, the, that Christian that decides that they just want to throw in the towel and coast and glide along, they miss out on some of the greatest answers to prayer. I mean, you miss out if, you don't, if you're not able to come. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But, but if you are able to come and you choose not to come on Tuesday nights for our prayer meeting, you miss out on a lot. A lot happens here at this church because the prayer is a gas that drives the engine. And we're grateful for those that are faithful prayer warriors that keep things going. You know? Last but not least, they can lose their reward. The judgment in, in heaven will come. Well, they'll not be judged for whether they can go to heaven or hell. That's settled at the cross. But there will be rewards given at the beam of seat of Christ. They're, they will get those rewards if they've been faithful to God. There's five crowns you can win, and you want to be able to access those, and you can access those. But if we decide to just coast along, we don't do anything for Christ, we don't witness to anybody, we can lose out on a lot of those things. Here's a harm in lukewarmness. Um, you are an example. Every person in this room is an example to somebody else. You are exhibit A for the Savior. Your children are watching you. Your grandchildren are watching you. Your great-grandchildren are watching you. So what your children become is often is what you are in your home. If you have a child in your home, they are going to grow up with your values. They're going to grow up with your morals and your standards and your convictions. So what you are is what they most likely will become. Their character is shaped by you and how you respond to situations. Um, when someone from the outside world sees you don't live any different than they do, then they conclude, well, there's no difference between them and me. I, I don't see anything that, no richness in their Christianity, no reality in their Christianity. It just seems to be a badge that they wear. The greatest blight on the church today is lukewarmness. Christ means very little to those people in their lives. They've been saved, but that's as far as it goes. They just kind of let everything else slide. Everything else just coast along. So I want us to consider, number one, we have um, a lukewarmness to sin, and that's a danger. When we become lukewarm to sin, we say, okay, anything goes. Uh, well, I can tolerate that. I mean, tolerate, the word tolerate is, is bandied around the world today so much. There was a day when we said certain things were sinful, and I'm not talking about 150 years ago. I'm talking about 25, 30 years ago. We said, hey, th this isn't really right. Uh, we said it was not right for Christians to indulge in those particular things. But today, we just smile, go ahead. You know, Folks say, well, times have changed. Well, that might be. Times have changed. And that's true. But God has not changed. You know, sin has not changed. It's still true Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's still true, the wages of sin is death. It's still true, sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. You know, we live in an age when we are not uh, shocked anymore. You know, I remember, you know, um, I grew up in a construction site, and my first week on the construction site, I was shocked. I was just a teenager, but by the language and so on. But the more you're there, the more you hear it, the more you're exposed to it, uh, um, you kind of get desensitized to it. But today, we're no longer shocked, it would seem, by things that are going around us. We just kind of accept it as that's the way the world is. We have lost the ability to blush. When things are not right, and we know they're not right, we just say, oh, well, that's just them. <laughs> it, it seems even in Christian lives today, anything goes. You know, even the Lord's Day. Today, it's the Lord's Day. And yet there are some churches that have, uh, you know, uh, kind of isolated themselves as far as, uh, um, you know, what the Lord's Day is all about. And it becomes man's day, not Lord's Day. You know, and 
tonight we're going to get out, or today we're going to get out. Uh, I promise I'll be done before tonight. But, but this morning we'll get done, uh, and maybe it'll be 5 after 12, or 12, 12, or 12, 15, or who knows, maybe as much as 12, 20. I don't think so. But uh, if it is, you know, how often do we think, oh, man, I'm losing the afternoon. Well, wait a minute. Whose day is it? It's the Lord's day. Now, let's give him his due. You know, sin seems to have become respectable in a lot of circles today. Folks have brought it in from the backyard into their living room, so it would seem. Adam and Eve, you know, when they had sinned in the Garden of Eden, uh, you know, what did they do? The first thing they did was hid. They, they went to hide from God. Why? They realized that there was something wrong, and they were ashamed. You know? But today, it would seem folks don't care who knows about their sin. They just wear it as a badge in a lot of cases. You know, there's a young man who used to come to our church here, and I remember meeting him downtown Aurelia. I won't tell you who he is because it doesn't matter. But whenever I'd meet him downtown Aurelia, and he was one of our young people, he'd take his cigarette that he'd been smoking, and he'd see me, and he'd put it behind his, his back like I wouldn't know. You know, the, the tendril of smoke coming up behind his head. <laughs> and, and he would try to hide it um, as... The weeks went by, the months went by, and then a year, he didn't feel ashamed about it anymore. And I'd go by and, you know, he'd just uh, continue smoking his cigarette. What happened? He got desensitized to the fact that the preacher was there. You know, it's easy for us to say that things are, well, they're not so bad. (laughs) Um, But I want to tell you this morning, Satan is in charge of many Christian lives today. He sold them a bill of goods. Now, he cannot have their soul. If they are saved, they are secure. However, he can destroy the fellowship with God and their fellowship with other Christians. And the old devil can steal the joy of your salvation if you're not careful. We need to recognize its power and stay close to Christ because you and I are no match for the old devil on our own steam. However, when Christ is in the, uh, in the equation, the Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, meaning Jesus Christ is much greater than Satan will ever be. Although he is a great counterfeiter, he tries to imitate everything God does, he is still just a counterfeiter. So we need to try and save our kids from his clutches. We need to pray for our kids regularly. We ought to be concerned about our kids all the time. What are they watching? Who are they running with? Who are they playing with? What are they being taught in school? The only way to do it is to go all out for Jesus Christ and and pray much, read the Bible much, and, and set the right kind of example for those around us. We need to put the Lord first in our everyday life. You know, in all things, Not just on our Bible time when we read in the morning or in the evening whenever you have your Bible time, but put him first throughout your whole day. You'll find by including him in your day, things will work out much better for you. And secondly, we have a lukewarmness about soul salvation. I mean, sharing the gospel with others. I'm talking about the lost right now. They believe the Bible in a lot of cases. You will talk to people, and particularly in Canada, you'll ask them, hey, are are you a Christian? They will, of course. You know, I live in Canada. We live in a Christian nation. That's not what I'm talking about. Have you been born again? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you asked him to forgive your sins? They know that they're lost, but they do have some respect for the Bible still as being God's Word. Not everywhere, but in many cases I have found that. But it it doesn't seem to matter. They say, well, someday, you know, I think I'll be a Christian. How many times have we had... um, Young people, our folks come to our church, and they, we witnessed to them. They sat through a message. They heard the salvation message. And then they just walked out, and, and nothing changed. Nothing was different. My prayer for every person in this room, uh, whether you're saved or unsaved, is when you come into these doors, you leave changed. By that, I mean if you're not saved, that you will be saved, and you walk out there a brand new person for Jesus Christ. If you are saved, that you can be encouraged, and that you can, you can learn something that will help you in your daily struggles with the uh, world that we live in today. You know, they say, well, someday I plan to come to church. How many people have you uh, talked to like that? Well, you've invited them to come to church. Well, someday I'm going to do that. But they go ahead looking you know, um, at everything else in the world and neglect the most important thing. Well, there's a ball game on. Or there's a, you know, uh, they're, 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 they've opened up the beach for the summer. You know, they, there's so many distractions today. Um, If somebody is hostile towards Christianity, we don't expect that uh, they're going to get saved. 
but many good people will go to hell simply because they become indifferent. And that's one of the packages the old devil puts together and sells us a, bit, a bill of goods. He doesn't oppose to someone understanding they need to be saved as long as he can say, put it off till tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes, oh, put it off till tomorrow. Or get them distracted, oh, put it off till next week. You know, I witnessed to a man who was uh, um, sitting on this spiritual fence. He, he wasn't saved. And I said, you know, you're just as lost as Paul Bernardo, you know, or, or uh, Bill Cosby or uh, Justin Trudeau. Um, sorry, I didn't mean that. Well, I meant it, but I don't, didn't mean I meant it, but I meant it. Anyways, uh, they could not fathom that, but the truth is you're either lost or you're saved. There's no middle ground. Number three, uh, we have a lukewarmness about Christian integrity. The average Christian intends to pay their debts, but some are lukewarm about it. You know, the Bible says we have a responsibility to have a good testimony in the world around us. We, we ought not to be dishonest. Uh, there are simply people, and I mean born-again Christians, that are so indifferent about it, they just don't care. Years ago, I tried to help some folks. Uh, my wife and I went and we counseled with them. They were struggling financially, and so we were able to give them some of our money to help them out. Um, but uh, it just seemed like, it, you know, it didn't make any difference. Um, it just, we tried to console them, get them moving in the right direction so they could get a handle on their situation, but they were simply indifferent about it. And after a while, um, you know, it caused a great mark on their Christian life as far as being a witness to anybody else, to their testimony, their integrity, all came into question. See, Christians not, not to be lukewarm about telling the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when he enters into you, you have the truth, the living truth. Truth is truth as a Christian should uh, be and not water it down. Or not try to compromise and, you know, paint it with a different stroke of a different brush. But the fact is, you have right and wrong. You have truth and false. I know a man who is uh, a good, good person, a good moral living guy. Um, but he cannot tell the truth. It's sad. Um, he, it just seems like he is inundated with wanting to lie or at least giving over to lying all the time. People like him uh, instantly. He's that kind of a person. He is... Uh, that kind of a personality, he attracts people to him. But soon people realize he doesn't tell the truth. Now, I'm not talking about other politicians. I'm talking about somebody else that I know. But he loses their respect and their trust. He may be a slick talker. I mean, some of these guys could talk a squirrel out of a walnut tree, and you wouldn't even know it. And, and yet, even though he's a slick talker, he has a character flaw, that character flaw that makes him untrustworthy. People don't trust him. I heard another man say about a completely different person than that. He said, his word is as good as his bond. <laughs> Question, is yours? It ought to be. We ought to stand for something as Christians. Can the world depend on what you say? You know, a consistent, consecrated Christian is sensitive to telling the truth. Because when uh, the temptation to alter the truth comes along, there's something inside that jumps up and says, no, that's not right. A lukewarm Christian is indifferent. You know, many uh, years ago, my, my father-in-law passed away, my wife's dad, and uh, he worked at uh, General Electric. Later on, it became um, uh, Black & Decker, but he worked there for 22 years. Um, and in those 22 years, he had three sick days. He just chose to go to work, even when he didn't feel good. He liked that phrase, you know, don't call in, crawl in. You just go to work. That's your responsibility, to be at work. And he would just go to work and work whether he felt good or he didn't feel good. Several years ago on 680 News, um, they had um, uh, a, a lineup of people going in to see a Harry Potter movie, one of the most recent ones. And uh, uh, they did an interview with people who were lined up interviewing them and, uh, for this. And um, six out of ten people said that they had taken sick leave at work in order to bring their kids to that movie. What is that? Well, number one, they lied about being sick, and, and then they probably stole money from their employer by collecting, you know, sick benefit wages. What did they do? They lied. They set an example for their children of what is acceptable or not acceptable. And number four, we have a lukewarmness towards our obedience to God. He not only is our Savior, He is our God. 
He is our Father. He is our Savior. Uh, you know, He is the, uh, the Lord of our lives, the, uh, the one that guides and directs us. We ought to serve Him with all honesty. Uh, you know, and ought not to allow that lukewarmness of service to God get diminished. We are to learn from the Bible what He wants us to do, and then we are to do it. It's as simple as that. Find out God's will for your life and do it. So easy to find out what the will of God and say, well, that's uncomfortable. I don't want to do it. Well, you have the choice. God didn't make you a puppet. He didn't make you a computer. He made you a human being with a, a will to choose one way or the other. It is wise for you as a born-again Christian, if you want to live right, choose right, and do right. You know, we're not to be lukewarm about his commandments. We ought to say this is his word, and then we ought to obey it. You know, when the Jews returned to the Holy Land, they rebuilt the city there in Jerusalem. Everybody's excited. Everybody's working together. And, and they saw the, the, the city going up again. And when the work had been finished, when they got it all done, they said, Now, we want to hear God's word. You know what happened? <laughs> the scriptures were brought out, and they were given to Ezra and, and, and to the people. And uh, from dawn until noon, which is almost eight hours, they read from the Word of God. They listened, they sat, and they, they, they listened to the Word of God. They saw where they had violated His commandments, and the Bible says they wept. They were sad about it when they realized they had not followed God the way He intended for them to. And so they said, we want to get our lives into line with the Lord once again. We want to regulate our lives by His commandments, by His Word. And God forgave them and blessed them could I suggest that's what we need in 2023 in the lives of God's people around the nation today? First, go to the Bible and see what it is about God's word that he has for you to do. What are the commandments? What is it his plan is for you? Uh, we go to the Bible. Second, you ask yourself, am I lined up with what God's word says how I should be living? Am I faithful? Um, do I put my faith and trust in Christ above every other institution? The Bible says that tithing is our plain duty. I, I'm not preaching a stewardship message this morning, but I could very easily go to the book of Malachi chapter 3. I could show you plainly, and then into Matthew, how Jesus uh, referred to the Pharisees, but uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying the Bible says it's our responsibility to tithe. And by the way, if you tithe, God will bless you. If you don't tithe, well, he said he will send the devourer. So, you know, that means he will take that money anyways. You're better off to get, it, get the blessing by, by tithing rather than having God send the devourer and take it away from you. And then you get nothing. The Bible says we are to obey the Lord in baptism and in observing of the Lord's Supper. The Bible says we are to witness to others. We're uh, uh, to try to live so others, when they see us, will say, hey, there's something different. The Bible says to first ye seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Um, are you seeking him today? Do you seek him daily? Do you find out what his will is for your life? To get the answers for the problems that come across uh, your desk or across your world, uh, across your life, the questions that maybe you don't have answers for? Do you seek him this morning? He wants to hear from you because he has the answer for you. Every church would have a revival if members checked the lies uh, by the word of God, you know, uh, checks and balances. Am I where I'm supposed to be? And, and brought their lies into line with the teaching of this book. You know, our churches would be crowded. Um, souls would be one. People would be lining up to get into the church. The gospel would be spread to the ends of the earth, if that were the case. The world would know the reality of the Christian faith as being real, as got substance. There's something there I need. That's what the world is looking for. You talk to anybody. I know a number of, uh, well, a number of millionaires, and, and I know at least one billionaire, and I know that they are ever grasping, looking for something more, just a little bit more. Talk to one guy, and he says, Glenn, I just got to have one more project. Man, you got a house in Denver. You got a house in uh, um, Durango. You got a house over in Los Angeles, and you have all these buildings across the, the country. You have a, a monstrosity of a business. Why do you bother? Why not just relax for a little bit? He says, no, he said, I got to keep going. Just one more thing. How sad. He did not say. He was ever grasping for peace, 
ever grasping for satisfaction, ever grasping for fulfillment. You know what? That's exactly what you have in your heart tonight or this morning if you know Christ is your Savior. You have those things. You don't have to go grasping. God gives them to you. In Israel, um, well, it was about seven years ago, uh, when I was there, I was uh, up on the Valley of Elah, or the Valley of Elah is down up on the hillside where the Philistines had been, and there was a sundial there. Now, a sundial, although it seems kind of uh, aquatic, it's a, you know, um, is an accurate time measurement with the sun. But it would be absolutely of no value, it would be absolutely useless if somebody built a roof over top of it. It wouldn't work. The Bible can be of no value to the Christian if you leave the cover closed on your desk, on your table, week after week after week. Unless you open it and allow the sun to, to shine through you, the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart. Today, more Christians know more about the latest tabloids than, you know, or Reader's Digest than they know uh, about the Bible. How sad is that? They know more about the political stature of our country or other countries than they know about God's love. Even in Canada, it seems Christians know more about Donald Trump and Joe Biden than they do about Luke or John. They know more about Britney Spears than they know about the Apostle Paul. They know more of the latest hockey negotiations than they do about Samson. They know more about uh, LeBron James or uh, uh, Shaquille O'Neal than they do about Jesus Christ because that's where their focus is. That's where attention is. The Bible is God's second best gift to man. First best gift was Jesus Christ himself. He gave himself for you. He died on the cross for you. But the Bible is his love letter to you and to his people. We ought not to be lukewarm about it. We ought to study it. We ought to enjoy it. We need to bathe ourselves in it. And by the way, you'll find out a lot of questions you have for life are answered for you right here. You know, it's interesting. Mr. Moody was once asked by a woman. Um, she had heard him preaching, and she came to him, and uh, she said, I am the most miserable person um, in the world. Uh, I've been saved, Mr. Moody, but you know, when I got married, my, my husband wasn't saved, and, and I, he was so close to getting saved, I married him anyway. And she said, would you please, Mr. Moody, pray for my husband? Well, um, Mr. Moody says, well, let me ask you a question first. Do you ever lose your temper and yell at your husband? She said, yes. Uh, then when you want to witness to him, do you feel everything is not right? Yes. Do you have trouble with your servants and lash out at them? Uh, yes. Then when you witness to them, do you feel that you know, your word has no effect, like everything is not all right? Uh, yes. Well, perhaps I should pray for you instead of your husband. She said, uh, yes. Yes, please do. The next week, her husband come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And three of her servants come to know Christ as Savior. She begged forgiveness of them and told them how she cared for their souls and that she had made a mistake by trying to browbeat them or to, to, to debate them or argue with them into heaven. Number five, we have a lukewarmness today about prayer. We believe in prayer, but many are lukewarm about it. We believe, we see what happens. We, we can oftentimes uh, uh, attribute to things that happen because of prayer but we still become lukewarm about it. And, 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 and it must make the Lord think, why don't you listen to me? I answered your prayer over here miraculously, and yet you're trying to do everything on your own steam on this side. Why won't you involve me in everything? You know, we know the power of prayer. We know uh, how Jesus answers prayer, yet we neglect to pray as we should. And if you don't know the power of prayer, you need to hang around here for a little while. I mean, you look around, we don't have any millionaires in here. We don't have any uh, a great masses of number, and yet God has seen fit to take care of the orphanage in Cambodia, and right now is running at about $15,000 a month to run. You say, whoa, that's more than our church budget. You're right. And in 16 years, we've not missed one meal. God has provided time and time again. How does he do it? Your prayer. It's your prayer. I mean, it's a power of God unleashed by you believing and praying. That's the extent of the, the prayer life. You know, um, it's so sad. We jump into bed and we whisper, oh, thank you, Lord, for the day and forgive my sins and bless me and my family. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're snoring and we're asleep. That's not good communication. Trust me. I tried it with my wife. You know, it doesn't work. Uh, good communication is you speaking and allowing that person to speak with you. And God says, I want to speak with you. You know, um, 
is so shallow a relationship with Christ. We ought to have a place and a time uh, where we can go and pour out our hearts to God and uh, give God our petitions and then wait upon the Lord and see what he will do. You know, prayer is our greatest source of power. Um, but when a Christian loses uh, uh, that power because of indifference, they suffer so much. You know, uh, they lose out on that, that punch, that power that God has for them in answered prayer and giving direction and giving uh, a notice where notice needs to be taken in our own hearts to keep us in line with him. But most importantly, it gives us the opportunity to be a witness to those we love and we care about. You know, um, it's sad when, he, when a Christian gets uh, sick, they depend on the doctor first and the Lord next. <laughs> We've got to be the other way around. Pray first, then go to the doctor. I'm not saying avoid the doctor. No, I go to doctors too. God has blessed us with good medical here in Canada. You say, well, it's not that great. I had to wait for two hours in the office. You come with me to Cambodia in October. <laughs> you know, trust me, it's not like this at all. You might wait in line with maybe 200 people out in a, about 35 degree weather, no shade. Uh, uh, all in line waiting to get in to see a doctor and people lying down on the sidewalk because they are, they are so sick and they can't get up and move. And then you go into the hospital room, you go into where they have them in a room this size and people are laid out like cordwood on the floor, not on stretchers. And uh, 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 they don't get anything to eat uh, unless somebody from their family brings them something to eat. It's not like our, our medical system at all. Trust me, we ought to be thankful what we have been given here. Uh, Prayer is our greatest source of power. But when the Christian wants, you know, to have something accomplished, we try everything on our own steam first. When they're in trouble, we use our own ingenuity instead of trusting God's word, instead of talking to God and giving it to God. We, we lose many blessings, you know. Um, I wish you had been in Cambodia with me uh, and my wife last uh, October and... Uh, we have our own room there at the children's home. We sleep up on the third floor. And we have one bedroom up there. And a uh, um, number of years ago, I bought a bed uh, for us to sleep on there. But um, when you get older, like, now how can I say this kindly? No, like me, not my wife. When I get older like me, um, and you lay down in a bed, and it's hard, pretty soon your back gets sore. And, and, and you just, no matter what you do, you can't get comfortable. And we had a mattress like that. It was so hard. But it was a good mattress. It only gets used maybe, you know, uh, a month or a month and a half every year. And so I said to my wife, you know, I would like a new mattress too. I mean, that, it's hard for me. Why don't we go and buy a new mattress? So we went to the store and we found a brand new mattress for $250. And uh, we had it delivered to the house. And uh, meanwhile... Um, we picked the old mattress up, but it's like brand new. I mean, there's no marks on it. It's just, it's like it came out of the showroom. And we have it standing up in the hall. And uh, I said to Brother Roth, our administrator, I said, Brother Roth, you know anybody that might need a, a mattress? And my wife said, well, maybe Brother David over at the Floating Village could use it. And I said, that's a good idea. Brother Roth, give Brother David a call. Unbeknownst to us, that morning, Brother David had woke up early in the morning and his wife, because they woke up, woke up immediately together in a, a start, because out from underneath their mattress, inside the mattress, was a huge nest of mice that had moved in. And so when they moved around, a whole trickle of mice came running out from inside their mattress. His wife screamed, he jumped up, they grabbed the mattress and tipped it up, still mice coming out of it, and his wife says, get it out of the house! He throws it outside. And uh, now, they don't have a bed like you and I, the mattress just sits on the floor. And his wife says, well, now, honey, what are we going to do? We don't have a mattress. He said, we'll just have to pray about it and see what God will do. I don't know. We can't afford to buy a mattress. You understand. I mean, the average wage in Cambodia is only about $4 a day. And so they can't just go out and buy another mattress. And so they said, well, we'll pray about it. And after they prayed, the phone rang. It was Brother Roth. He said, Brother David, do you know anybody that might be interested in a new mattress? <laughs> do you think God heard his prayer? You bet he did. He came and his wife started to cry when she sought that new mattress. She thought it was like an old, used, run-down mattress. They were so excited. You know, we see that happen over and over and over again in, you know, serving the Lord. Whether it's Cambodia or here in Canada, God is no respecter of distance. You know, he is able to answer your prayer no matter where you are. 
I was riding my horse down through uh, Alberta and as I'm coming along the Cowboy Trail, Highway 24, and as I'm riding along, it's cold, I mean terribly cold. And I don't have proper sh uh, uh, jacket on and I'm riding a long ways. I'm riding like 7,000 miles from the Alaskan Ocean to southern Mexico and I was praying, God, I, I got a lot of winter to come. I could sure use a, a warm coat. And as I'm riding along there in the ditch along Highway 24, the Cowboy Trail, there's a black plastic bag fluttering, I thought, and I just continued riding my horse by there. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, stop, Len, go back there. I said, man, the wind's blowing, it's cold, I'm going back there. And I keep on riding. And then the Holy Spirit said, no, go back there. So, okay, I'll go back. I back my horse up, I back up my horse and back up. Pretty soon there's that, oh, it's not a black plastic bag like I thought. I got off my horse and I ground hitched my horse. I went over and I, I picked it up. And uh, what do you think it was? A brand new, down-filled jacket, winter jacket, my size. God provided. It had been there for several days. Somebody obviously lost it off the back of their vehicle. But God heard me in a prayer, and he had already arranged for that to be there a long time before I even prayed. No, that's how God wants to answer your prayer. He already has the answer for you. It's already waiting there for you if we'll just trust him. We usually wait till we are in some great extremity or turmoil before we pray. God wants to hear from us all the time. Number six, and I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, we are lukewarm uh, when it comes to our service to Christ. Every church I know of is crying out for faithful, dedicated church workers today. And I'm, I mean everyone that I know of. And many Christians start out you know, to work for the Lord, but they become lukewarm about their service. After a while, I mean... Uh, they don't see it paying in dollars and cents, and so they're looking for other dividends, and when it comes to the point of just serving, they lose sight of what they really are there for. You know, um, what God is looking for is a group of workers with zeal and a heart that is hot and healthy and wanting to serve Him. God's looking for their service. It doesn't cost you uh, much to do that. Just, I'll be faithful. That's what God says. I want you to just be faithful. You know, there's a story told of a uh, deaf and a dumb man that uh, lived near Knoxville. My wife and I will be down there uh, in about um, a month time preaching at uh, uh, Brother Todd Peoples Church. And uh, this man was a, a good Christian man, but um, of course he couldn't speak to anybody because he was both deaf and dumb. And, uh, but he'd get on the bus and uh, he'd ride the bus, you know, uh, five days a week. And then um, he worked about seven miles from where he lived, and uh, for years he rode the bus. The same streetcar worker was on there all the time. One day he boarded, you know, he, he smiled at the conductor, and he put his fare in. He went back, sat down, and he started to read his Bible. Then he would do that day after day after day. One day after several years, the conductor on the streetcar uh, handed him a note. He said, sir, I'm not a Christian, but for years I have watched you and you have something that I need more than anything else. More than anything else in the world. Please turn the note over and write a place and time down and an interpreter and I will be there because I need to be saved. What happened? The conductor got saved. They say, wow, that was a nice story. It never seemed to happen in 2023. Last week, uh, Brother Al Stone was uh, out in Western Canada and talking with uh, my friend uh, Don Swatsky. Don Swatsky, sales manager, um, his wife got saved a week ago. And uh, Don's wife, Joy, led her to the Lord. And so uh, Don said to uh, Al Stone, said, Al, you're in the area. Can you drop in and see my sales manager? He needs to be saved. His wife just got saved. So Al thought, no, well, okay, I'll go. You know, and uh, sometimes those impromptu invitations don't always work out good, but Don had prayed about it, and Joy had prayed about it, and that lady that knew he was saved prayed about it. When Al Stone went there, you know what the man said to him? He said, I just barely got sit down. I bought him a cup of coffee, and he said to Al Stone, I need more than anything in the world to get saved today. You know, that happens. It happens in 2023, and it happens all around the world today if people would be faithful, you know. I just pray that we can live every day as if we would know there is a reality when it comes to our Christian lives and our service to God and just be faithful. For God calls us to be faithful. He loves you this morning. He cares for you no matter where you are, whether you are uh, uh, saved newly and only been saved a few weeks or whether you've been saved for many, many years. God loves you. His plan is still perfect for you. You say, but preacher, it's just kind of gotten old and mundane for me. Trust me, it's not old and mundane if we get in the battle. 
It's not all the mundane if we get into service. God will use you. I have long time said, God will use anybody that's willing to be used. Are you willing this morning to sell it to him completely? That's my prayer for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we could spend together this morning for each one that is here. And Father, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray they'll get that settled today. That's the most important thing that could ever happen in this church building today. And Father, if there's some here that are maybe sitting on the fence and, and they just have not made a commitment of full service to you, I pray that they decide that. I'm not talking about going and being a pastor or a missionary somewhere, but being in full service in their Christian lives, giving everything over, their family, their homes, their lives, their jobs, their careers, giving it to you and allowing you to direct them and guide them and bless them. Father, for each one, maybe there's some struggling today that just, you know, they've been not enjoying the sweet joy of the salvation that they have been given by Christ or maybe not enjoying answered prayer the way they could or not enjoying the, the joy of seeing loved ones saved or maybe they're here and they're not enjoying the, the sweet fellowship bef- between a father in heaven and their own hearts because as your children, we know you love us. Father, I just pray, if there's anyone here this morning the need to get those things settled, to get it done today. Drive a stake and say, today is the day that I'm going to get right with the Lord. Today is the day I've been sitting on the fence too long. Yeah, I'm saved, but I certainly need to get into the battle. I need to get started. I need to get working. Father, if there's any like that here today, I pray that they would respond in our closing song. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.